So just want to welcome everyone in person and online. And so just to those who are joining us online, we're, we're definitely later than normal. Just the Lord really moved. I'm not saying that to make you jealousy. We're here. But just uh, the Lord's presence really was on us, and the Lord really moved. And uh, so anyway, we didn't want to interrupt the flow of the Holy Spirit. So that's why we're 25 minutes past the normal time. But anyway, I, I do want to share today the, the message that... This is actually the last teaching of indwelling life. So this is, you know, the eternal life. It's like, will this thing ever end? Now, we almost spent a year talking about indwelling life. And this is session 19, Christ dwelling in your heart. This is my, I think this, this might be my favorite session. Um, the truths of this are so powerful, so incredible. And so anyway, we're going to, we're going to talk about this today. This is, we've, been, you know, we've been talking about 10 laws of the Spirit-led life and all that's involved in the Spirit-led life. There are certain principles or certain laws that must be followed that if we want to live by the Spirit, we want to live from the Spirit, by the Spirit. And the 10th the law, the 10th principle we're going to examine is this. I'm going to read this slowly so we get it. Is, is Christ dwelling in your heart is of utmost importance. For whoever dwells in your heart, whether self or Christ, will be the source of life from which you live. It's huge. This is a huge principle. This is a huge thing. And, and you know, we teach our kids, you know, just ask Jesus into your heart. And that's good. I mean, you don't want to try to explain to a five-year-old, okay, technically, uh, five-year-old, technically he doesn't come to dwell in your heart, he comes to dwell in your spirit, but he enters, he enters through to your spirit, through your heart, you know, to a five-year-old, they're like, what? So we say, you know, ask Jesus into your heart. But Christ does not dwell in your heart automatically. He dwells in your spirit. And we've talked about your spirit and your heart are distinct. Hebrews 4.12 talks about that, that the, the sword of the spirit divides between the soul and the spirit, judging the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Jesus Christ does not dwell automatically in your heart if you're born again. Your spirit is automatically always joined to him. Your spirit is always connected to him. You don't have to try to get connected to Christ. You're already connected. You don't have to try to get joined to Christ. You're already joined to him. The spirit of God is has been grafted to your human spirit. So you are always one. I mean, we have drilled this. This is so important that, that you are one spirit with him. And yet what um, we're, the, the verse we're going to read in a minute, the truth of it is, is Christ does not dwell automatically in your heart. And whoever dwells in your heart, whether self or Christ, is going to be the life source from which you live. If you're living for yourself, it's because self is in, enthroned in your heart. If you're living by the life of Christ, Christ living his life in you and through you, it's because Christ has been enthroned in your heart. Whoever occupies your heart, whether self or Christ, is going to be the life source from which you live. I want you to see this in Ephesians 3, 16 through 17. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Ephesians 3, 16 through 17, that where Paul is writing and he says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. The inner man would be that innermost man, your spirit. He's really, Paul's really saying that your inner man that innermost man would be strengthened by the Holy Spirit who dwells in your spirit. Your spirit is joined to him and that the, the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead would strengthen your human spirit and your human spirit would be strong and strengthened. And listen, listen to what Paul said. So that, see the conditional statement there. It's not automatic. So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. Christ does not dwell in your heart automatically when you're born again. He dwells in your spirit. He must dwell in your heart 
by faith if we want to live the abiding life, if we want to live by the indwelling life of Christ, if we want to live by the life of Jesus Christ, then Christ must dwell in our hearts by faith. You see the condition, you see the condition there? That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. In other words, your spirit, if your spirit's not strong, Christ won't dwell in your heart by faith. If your spirit is strong, the overflow of that will be Christ will dwell in your heart by faith. Now let's look at another scripture verse here. And Romans 13, 13 through 14 says, Paul's writing, and he says, Let us behave properly as in the day, not carousing and drunken, not in carousing or drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality. And I mentioned, just, I just want to, I, I mentioned last Sunday in my message that I feel like as a leader after this whole Mike Bickle scandal that I have not been as clear as I needed to be about the seriousness of sexual sin. And I just want to say it again because the, it, it's very important, it's very, very important that leaders in the body of Christ especially in the charismatic church, are very clear on what Scripture teaches about sexuality and sex in Scripture. The Scriptures are very clear that, that sex is only permissible between one man and one woman in the context of marriage for life. Anything outside of that is sin, whether it's looking at pornography, whether it's engaging in fornication, whether it's sex outside of the marriage covenant, homosexuality, whatever it would be, anything outside of that is sin. And, and Jesus said that if you are looking at a woman to lust, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart, that you must fight that battle by plucking your eye out and cutting off your hand. And, and he said, it's better for you that if you enter life, uh, you enter life maimed than your whole body going into hell. Now, the Lord does not want you, you know, literally to pluck your eye out. He does not want you literally to cut your hand off. He's saying you must wage war against the sexual sin. You must wage war against the eyes of lust, the eyes of adultery. You must wage war against the lust of the flesh because Jesus would not have given that warning if, if eternal separation from God in hell was not a, a, a threat or a real uh, th a threat or a possibility for, sec for those engaged in sexual sin. It should put the fear of God in us. It should put the fear of God in us that if we play around with, the, with sexual sin, that, our, you know, Hebrews talks about our, our, our hearts can be hardened. Sin has the ability to harden our hearts. This is why it's so dangerous to sin against the Lord. Sin has the ability to harden our hearts. Sin has the ability to deceive you. And when you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. That's why it's deception. I mean, I mean, really, it's like the problem with deception is you don't know you're deceived. That's deception. And so sin has that power to harden you. And the problem is when you're hardened, only God can soften you. <laughs> It's a, it's a very scary thing to become hardened by sin. You don't know where that's going to lead you. You don't know the deception that can come by, by sin and that constant lifestyle of sin. We need the fear of the Lord back in the church again. We have to have it back in the church again. The fear of the Lord has just, is basically absent out of the church. And this whole thing with Mike Bickle, the scandal that's been going on since October, well, it's been going on for a long time, but since it's come to the light, has really put it in my heart. We've got to be very clear about what Scripture teaches about sexual sin and the consequences for violating what God says in His Word. And so Paul says, let me read it again. Romans 13, 13 through 14, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and in drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and in jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, this is beautiful. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it's not like you go into your closet and you get the Jesus outfit on. That's not what he's talking about. So how do you do it? And, I, and as we're going to get into this message, you're going to see Paul's really talking about putting Christ on to your heart. He's really talking about what 
Paul said in Ephesians 3, that so that Christ may dwell in your heart. He's really talking about clothing your heart with Christ, clothing your heart with Jesus Christ, so that his presence would fill your heart by faith. And then Paul says, and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Now, this word provision is very interesting. It actually means in the Greek forethought, to think beforehand. In other words, what Paul is getting at here, I never knew this but Paul, until this morning when I looked it up. What Paul is really saying when he says, make no provision for the flesh, he's really saying, cut off the thoughts of lust immediately when they come. Because no one has ever sinned unless they first thought about the sin. <laughs> it doesn't just happen randomly. It happens because there were thoughts in your mind, thoughts in your heart that you began to meditate on, and that meditation led to action. And Paul is saying, no, don't make provision for those lusts of the flesh. Don't make provision for those thoughts. That thoughts, those thoughts that come beforehand, cut those off. It's the same thing Paul said, those who are living by the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. That's the same thing going on here that Paul's saying is that don't make provision for the flesh. Don't, don't have forethought about the flesh and those things of the flesh and those things your flesh wants. Instead, make Jesus Christ Lord. Put on, and I love how he says, he doesn't just say, just say, put on Jesus Christ. He says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Lord. He needs to be Lord in your actions. Jesus told a crowd, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? The Lord is looking for something way more than mere profession of faith or mere words or mere we, you know, yes, Jesus is my Lord, and you're living for yourself, and you're living in sin, and you're living in the flesh. No, he's not your Lord if you're living for yourself. Faith without works is dead. We've got, that's why James said, don't just tell me you believe, show me you believe by what you do. See, if we're just merely professing lordship, and we're not, we don't, we're not sanctifying Jesus as Lord in our heart, getting self out of the heart and enthroning Christ, then he's not really Lord in reality. So that's, what, that's where we're heading right now in this message is, is we want to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, to live by his life. Christ must be Lord of our heart. He must have the occupation of our heart. He must, his presence must occupy. His presence must permeate. His presence must fill our hearts. And I was thinking about this. Uh, this, this is a, hopefully this, this analogy will help you, really help me. But I remember a while back, Angie and I were watching the movie The Current Wars, The Current War, The Current War, not, not with an S, The Current War. And it was talking about like the battle between Thomas Edison and George Westinghouse in terms of whose electrical source would win. And uh, Edison had the, uh, the DC current and Westinghouse had the AC current. You know, I don't even know what it all means, but you can go do the research if you're, if you're scientifically interested in that. But long story short, Westinghouse won the current war because he used Niagara Falls to create a hydroelectric power plant. And that, that electric power plant lit up Buffalo and then later New York City. And so... That, that analogy helped, you know, kind of made me think, this is what it is to live by the indwelling life of Christ. And how does that relate? So I'll, I'll relate it like this. Your spirit is like a reservoir. Your spirit has everything you need for life. If you're born again, if you're, you're born again, you have everything you need for life and godliness in your spirit. Your spirit, like I've, like I've just said over almost every Sunday, your spirit is connected to the Holy Spirit. Your spirit has been joined to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been grafted to your spirit. Your spirit is literally touching the Spirit of God at all times if you're born again. You are literally joined and in union with Christ spirit to spirit. Always if you're born again. Now you have in your spirit, you are a partaker of the divine nature. In your spirit, you have everything you need for life and godliness. In your spirit, you have all of that you need. And so your spirit's like a reservoir. Now, your soul is like a dam. Your, you know, your soul determines the, the, the amount 
of the release of water that comes through to bring about the energy and the power. And so we talked about that last Sunday, is your will, your soul, your will is the gatekeeper. Your will determines whether you live by the body, whether you live by the soul, or whether you live by the spirit. Your will determines those things. And so that, that's kind of like your soul is like a dam. Now, your heart, and, and I'll get into the heart to, just to remind us the difference between the soul and the heart later. Your heart is like the river on the other side of the dam that receives the water that comes in from the reservoir through the opening in the dam, that receiving river. Your heart is like that receiving river that receives the, the indwelling life of Christ from your spirit. And then like an aqueduct, your heart then distributes out the life of Christ to your thoughts, to your emotions, to your desires, to your body. That, hopefully that makes sense. But that, that's really helped me. And then what happens, just like that hydroelectric power plant generates energy and generates power, God, when, when the life of Christ is flowing through that dam, that opening in that dam, and it generates that energy and that power, that's what it's like when God's power begins to live in you and through you. His power generates that energy, that, that grace that's needed to live by his life. And so let's just, talk, let's just dive into this a little bit deeper now. Your spirit is like a reservoir. 2 Peter 1, 3, and we, we've talked about this a lot, but 2 Peter 1, 3 says, His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. You have already, if you're born again, if Christ is in you, you already have, listen, everything, everything, Everything you need to live a godly life. Everything you need to live by his life, you already have it. You don't have to cry out and say, looking up to heaven, God, pour out on me love, pour out on me peace. You have that already in your spirit. Your spirit is a reservoir. Your spirit is that container. Your spirit is that lake behind the dam with everything you need for life and godliness. And notice that Peter said is in the past tense, has granted, has granted. Now, this, what this means is because of the indwelling Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is joined to your human spirit, this means you already have all the love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control you need to be Christ-like in this life. Isn't that beautiful? You don't need, listen, you don't need God, a supernatural encounter. You don't, now, I'll, I'll take all those things for sure, but you don't need those things to live a godly life life-based, Christ-like life. You have what you need to overcome already inside of you. Your spirit is like a reservoir. You already have all the love you need to love God and love others. You already have all the joy you need to break the yoke of depression and heaviness on your life. You already have all the peace you need to overcome anxiety and worry that might hit you. You already have all the patience you need to deal with difficult people. And I'm sure we always are dealing with difficult people. You have the patience you need right now to overcome that challenge you would face to face a person who's difficult. You have that inside of you. You don't have to say, God, give me patience. You need to say, God, release the patience in me. You already have all the kindness you need to give a gentle answer that turns away wrath. I need to remember that when a door-to-door -door, door -door salesman comes up to me and rings the door, my dog barks, and I have to go out there. I was like, okay, I have the kindness I need to be nice, okay? You already have all the meekness you need to obey the Lord fully, not to resist him, not to argue your way out of and justify your way out of why you don't need to do it or why it doesn't really matter. That the meekness of Jesus Christ is already inside of your spirit. It just needs to be released. You have all the self-control. You know, we talked about lust. We, you, we talk about the lust of the flesh and whatever way it would manifest. You have inside of your spirit the self-control you need to bring your flesh into submission to your spirit. The spirit of God has given you self-control. It's your will now that determines yes or no. 
It's your will now that makes the decision, I'm going to live by the spirit or I'm going to live by the flesh. I'm going to live by the soul or I'm going to live by the body. I'm going to live by the spirit of God and his power and his anointing and his grace or I'm going to live by my own selfishness and uh, limited thinking and opinions and emotions. Because that brings me to the next point. Your soul is like a dam. Paul said that a natural man, it actually in the Greek means a soulish man, the man governed by the soul, the man governed by the soul who is governed by their mind, their rational thinking, their logical thinking, their deduction and logic and all those things, that analytical mind, that intelligent mind, or the emotions of how I feel and what I'm feeling right now and what I want when I want it and how I want it done, that's the soulish man. The soulish man being either a born-again Christian who suppresses the Spirit of God or the soulish man who does not have the Spirit of God. The soulish man living by their natural inclinations is like a dam to the, to the born-again believer that blocks the life of God from flowing. See, even though you already have everything you need for life and godliness in you, you have everything you need to love, you have everything you need for joy, for self-control and meekness and humility, all that's in you, even though you have all that in you, the soul is like a dam that blocks the Spirit of God and the release and the measure of the Spirit of God by how much you want. By, if you still want to live your life, you're going to limit and suppress the life of God inside of you. That's why we talked about last Sunday, like uh, Jesus said, unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains by itself alone. But unless that once that, that grain of wheat, that hard outer shell goes into the earth, cracks open, breaks open. No one likes the word brokenness because it usually means you don't get what you want, when you want it, how you want it. But when the soul breaks and the life that's already in that seed begins, can then begin to spring up and produce fruit. Your soul is like that dam that determines the release of, of, of the life of Jesus Christ. Your heart is like a receiving river. Your heart is that receiving river that receives the reservoir, the, the life, the water in that, in the, behind the dam. Your heart is like that river. That's why Paul said, so that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. It's conditional. When your mind is renewed and your will is crucified, then the life of Jesus Christ that's already inside of you can flow without any hindrance. Man, that's what we want. That's what we got to have. If we want to live by the life of Jesus Christ, if we want him to live his life in us and through us, we no longer living, but Christ living in us, then the mind must be renewed and the will must be crucified. The body of sin must be put to death so the life of Jesus in us can live in us and through us. When your spirit is strengthened as the uncontested leader and your spirit is made strong, that, then what happens is the life of God in you begins to overflow into the heart and Christ begins to live. And so that's really what we're after in this, in this class and this whole thing we're talking about is whoever dwells in your heart, whether self or whether Christ, will be the life source that you live by. No matter how much you say Jesus is Lord, if self is still sitting on the throne of your heart, Christ is not going to live. Christ, his life will be suppressed. His attributes will be suppressed. It'll be like, just like the water behind the dam, nothing will be released because you are living rather than him. You must put your will on the altar and say, not my will, but your will be done. You must set your heart apart and say, Jesus, be Lord, be king. The goal of this life, one of the goals of this life is that our hearts would become the permanent dwelling place of God. Nothing hindering, nothing obstructing, nothing getting in the way, nothing blocking the full release of the Spirit of God into the human heart because that will determine whether we live by the life of Jesus Christ or whether we live for ourselves whether we live by the soul and the body or whether we live by the spirit, whether we make provision for the lust of the flesh or whether we are led by the spirit of Jesus. So just to, just to help you clarify this, 
Just remember here my definition of the heart. I mentioned this way back in an earlier session. Just to, people get confused and they think the heart and the spirit are the same or the soul and the heart are the same. But just to, just to help give some clarity here is my definition of the heart. Just want to read this here. The heart is the deepest part of your soul. Remember, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. But the heart is the deepest part of your soul. And this is, I got just, just from studying many, many hours in Scripture what, about this. It is central to who you are and all you do, and it contains your deepest emotions, your deepest desires, your deepest beliefs, your deepest intentions, your deepest motives, your deepest thoughts, hopes, attitudes, convictions, affections, devotions, disposition, and character. It's the deepest part of you is your heart. Most importantly, or it's the deepest part of your soul. Probably the deepest part of you would be your spirit. But the deepest part of your soul is your heart. The heart determines your hunger, thirst, and desire for God. It's the heart. That's why Solomon said, watch over your heart with all diligence. Because out of the heart flows the issues of life. God is a heart God. God does not look at outward appearance. We know that from when David and Samuel anointed David as king. He's like, no, that's not the one. That's not the one. That's not the one. He's like, you're picking that one, that, that small guy over here that's insignificant, the youngest of all the brothers? You picked him? Yeah, God does not, and that's where the Lord, the Lord Samuel said, God does not look at the outward, the external. God looks at the heart. God's a heart God. God wants to dwell securely, fully, permanently in your heart. I just want you to get a vision for this, that would you be the kind of person who says, yes, Lord, dwell in my heart in fullness. He's coming to take over. That means you've got to get rid of your idols. That means you've got to get rid of self. That means you've got to get rid of your things and your toys and your pursuits and say, God, I am yours. He's not going to compete with a rival. He's not going to compete with your self-life. He's not going to compete with you getting what you want, when you want it, how you want it. He's coming to take over. He's Lord. I think he's under the impression he's Lord for some reason. <laughs> and he's not coming to negotiate with you. He's coming to conquer you and be Lord in your heart, be king in your heart. He's not negotiating with the nations when he returns. He's not negotiating with your inner lawyer when he wants to take over your heart. He says, well, I do it for this reason and this reason and this reason. And the Lord's like, I don't listen to your excuses. There, there's no excuses. I'm coming to dwell in your heart. I, I want to dwell permanently in your heart. I don't want to just dwell there for a day or two days or for a season I want to dwell in your heart permanently. I want your heart to be the habitation that I dwell in, the Lord would say to us. Not only does your heart receive the life of God, your heart distributes the life of God. Like an aqueduct, your heart distributes life to the rest of your entire being. So as the heart receives the life of Christ, your heart distributes the life of Christ to your thoughts, to your emotions, to your will, to your body. And I quoted this just earlier, but Solomon said in Solomon 4.23, watch over your heart. Watch over your heart. Are you drifting? Are you inclined towards sin? Are you inclined towards selfish living? Are you inclined towards lukewarmness and self-satisfaction? Has your hunger for God gone down? Watch over your heart. Because every issue of life flows out of your heart. That's what Jesus said in Matthew. He said, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, all kinds, of, all kinds of sin flow out of the human heart when self is enthroned. But think about that and reverse it, and you say, okay, when self is enthroned, those things, like Jesus said, come out. Evil thoughts, adultery, murder, fornication, coveting, those things flow out of the, out of the heart when self is enthroned. Now, what happens when the Lord himself is enthroned? 
What flows out of the heart? Just get a vision for that because if Christ can dwell in your heart without rival, then love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control will flow organically out of your heart. See, just like in the natural, as the physical heart pumps blood to the veins and the arteries, your spiritual heart, that deepest part of your soul, whether it's self or whether it's Christ, is going to pump out that, la- that life that fills your heart outward into your mind, into your thinking, into your emotions, into your choices, into your actions of your body. And so therefore, whoever is enthroned in your heart, whatever life source is enthroned in your heart as king is going to be the life source that's distributed to the rest of your being. Watch over your heart with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. Oh, that is something we got to just get a grip on. We don't think about that. We don't think about the human heart and all that's in the heart. But we can't, listen, we cannot fake who we are in our heart. Who you are in your heart is eventually going to come out. You cannot fake it. You can for a while, but who you are when you are squeezed comes out. (laughs) When you are squeezed, who you really are in your heart comes out. You can't fake it. The condition of your heart is who you are. And if you are living in your heart from self-life, I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do, and how I want it done, and Christ is not Lord in your heart, then when you are squeezed, the self-life is going to come out. That's why we need the, the cross to work in us. Paul talked about the old self and the new self. We we'll talked about this in Ephesians. We'll, we're, we'll look at these scriptures now. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. I, I encourage you to read Ephesians 2, 22 through 24 and meditate on it and pray over it and just really just wrestle with the Lord about this. This is an incredible passage of scripture talking about the, the, the new creation and the old creation. And And Paul said, in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. The old self is who you were in Adam minus your new spirit and new heart. So basically what the old self is, is the flesh, the unredeemed body and the unrenewed soul coupled together, working together to live for self. In reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. That's pretty sobering. Your flesh is in a constant state of corruption. It's not going to get better until your flesh is raised from the dead. So you think, well, I just need to use self-improvement. I just need to, you know, improve the flesh. The the, the flesh cannot be improved. It must be crucified. (laughs) The flesh is in a, I just want you to get the depravity. Listen, if we have seen anything over the last six months in the church, we have seen the, the reality of the depravity of man and the flesh that's in a constant state of corruption. See, if you live in the flesh, that ongoing corruption is going to keep evolving and evolving and getting more and more corrupt. It does not cease. I just want to paint that picture of, the, of why, we, why Paul said, we are under obligation, brethren, not to live according to the flesh, because if you live according to the flesh, you're about to die. You must live by the Spirit. It is something when you are born again... It is an obligation of the Lord to you, a mandate, a requirement that you live by the Spirit of the Lord and not by the flesh because the flesh is in a constant state of corruption. It's not going to get better until you get a new body. It's being corrupted in in accordance with the lust of deceit. That's why I said every time you, you can look at it, lust deceives you. It promises you what it cannot satisfy. You will never be satisfied. The flesh will never be satisfied. 
That's why Paul said, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do we get out of this old corrupt nature of the flesh that's in this constant state of corruption? How do we get out of that? Is we are renewed in the spirit of our mind, the renewing of the mind. We talked, we spent many, many sessions about the renewing of the mind and the importance of the renewing of the mind and changing the way you think and rewiring your thinking and rewiring your brain, rewiring your thought processes. That's how Paul says you get out of this corrupted state of the flesh that's being corrupted into the new creation of God by renewing your mind. And now notice what he says, put on the new self. Remember what we talked about at the very beginning when Paul said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the new self. They really are synonymous. Now, this verse is emphasizing the part of, is emphasizing your human spirit, but your human spirit is joined to Christ. So if you put on your human spirit, you put on Christ. He says, put on the new self, the new spirit. Now notice what he says, which in the likeness of God has been created, past tense, a finished work of the spirit when you were born again, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. He says, take it off. Take off the old self, put on the new self. Now, we get a little more clarity exactly what Paul was talking about. How, okay, what, if I put on the new self, where am I putting it on? Colossians, which is a very similar, Colossians um, 3, 9 through 14, is a very similar scripture. And Paul said, do not lie to one another. Since you lay a, do not lie to one another. Since you laid aside the old self, with his evil practices, and you put on the new self. Again, we're seeing the same language, old self, new self. Who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barba bar barbarian, uh, Scythian, slave, and free man, but Christ is all and in all. Now, this is where I want to get at. So are those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, Put on, again, you see that phrase, put on a heart of compassion. Where are you putting it on? Your heart. See, when you put on the new man and you put on Christ, you're putting it on to your heart. When you take off the old self and you take off the flesh, you're taking the old self out of your heart. When you put on the new self... You're putting the self on the heart because whoever occupies your heart, whether self or Christ, is going to be the life source from which you live. Put on a heart of love and compassion. He says, put on the new self, put on a heart of compassion, a heart of kindness. What are these? These are, these are the fruits of the Spirit. Put on a heart of compassion, a heart of kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Beyond all these things, put on love. See, putting on the new self means your spirit is strengthened. Christ overflows into the heart. He dwells in the heart. So putting on these attributes that we just talked about is really putting on the nature of Christ. It's putting on Jesus Christ. In the heart, taking off the old self from the heart, putting on the new self in the heart so that the life source you live by is the life of Jesus Christ. Now, let's talk about quickly five ways that we can do, five ways we can, we can actually do this. Hopefully, these are a little more practical. Is how do you, how do you put on a new heart? How do you put on a heart and, uh, of, of love? And compassion. And the first one I want to say is, is removing hindrances from the heart. Removing hindrances from the heart. If you ever feel like, God, I'm not breaking through here. Now, sometimes it's de often it's demonic. But there's also these times when you feel like, okay, God, there's something I can't quite Make that shift. I can't quite break through. What, Lord, what's going on? 
a lot of times it's something going on in your heart. Because remember, as a person is, as a person's heart is, so is the person. So if you experience these blockages, Lord, I can't break through. Lord, what's going on? Why am I keep bombarding with these thoughts? Why do these feelings keep overtaking me and I can't get victory over these anxious thoughts or this worry or this judgment or whatever? Lord, what is it in my heart that's driving this, this thought pattern? Ask the Lord, Lord, show me what's in my heart. That's, that, because remember, thoughts come from the heart. There's a, there is a heart and a mind connection is if we can't get certain thoughts out of our mind, now, there's a whole teaching on the demonic that is very important. You might deliverance, but in this teaching, we're talking about the heart-mind connection where if, if you can't break through, if you're bombarded with certain thoughts of anxiety or lust or worry or judgment or accusation or something like that, there's something in your heart that could be out of place, a crookedness in your heart, that needs to be corrected that will fix your mind and your thinking. There is a heart-mind connection. And so what, whenever I find that, I'm, okay, I'm struggling in something, I'm struggling to break through, I'm struggling to have the life of Jesus Christ released, what I always remember is, okay, what lie, Holy Spirit, what lie am I believing? What lie am I believing that's allowing these thoughts just to flow up and dominate my thinking. And when you realize, oh, no, you're believing this lie, and you confront that lie with the truth of God's word, what happens is your heart belief shifts, and then all of a sudden your thoughts begin to change because thoughts come from the heart, and your heart has made a shift. Your heart has repented. Your heart has had a change of thinking that affects your mind and your uh, thinking. That's the first one. The second thing we need to do, if we, want to, if we want Christ to live in our heart, if we want Christ to live in our heart, if we want him to dwell unhindered, is we have to sanctify Jesus Christ as Lord in our heart. 1 Peter 3.15, Peter is writing to believers. He's not writing to the unsaved. He's writing to believers, and he says this, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. That's something we have to do all the time, is to sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. There's three meanings of this word sanctify I want to look at. The first one means to render or acknowledge, to make, to hallow. In other words, this is saying there, there needs, if you want Christ to dwell in your heart unhindered, there is a hallowing, there is a sacredness, there is a fear of the Lord where you say, Lord, come and dwell in my heart. Come and dwell in my heart. Come dwell in my heart, hallowing him. He's Lord. You're not. He's God. You're not. Lord, we worship you. You are Lord. You are King. Come be Lord in my heart. Take over. It's a, it's a surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Lord, everything I am and everything I have is yours. All my property, all my possessions, all my money, everything is yours, Lord. You can have it. Be Lord. Be Lord. And this is not something you do just when you get saved. It's Peter saying, sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. In other words, as a believer, self can slowly creep back in and want to sit on the throne of your heart. That's why daily we need, or moment by moment, we need to say, Lord, be Lord of my heart. Rule and reign as King of kings and Lord of lords in my heart. Full surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Full surrender to his Lordship. The second meaning of this word for sanctify means to separate from profane things and to dedicate to God. It's a sanctification, a consecration. We need to live consecrated lives to God. That begins in the heart. What are those four thoughts you are thinking about that gives rise to the actions you take in the flesh? Those need to be consecrated to God. Those need to be set apart to the Lord. Those need to be put on the altar to say, God, you are Lord and not me. Consecrate, sanctify your heart to him and say, God, I will get rid of the profane things out of my heart, those things that are defiling my heart, those things that are corrupting my heart. That we would not be that the human heart, when you're born again, the human heart 
Okay, when you're not born again, the human heart is the source of all depravity that we see in this world. When you're born again, the human heart can be the source of depravity if you still live by self-life, or it can be the source of Christ's life. And whether or not we set him apart as Lord in our heart and consecrate our hearts to him, and we say, Lord, you be Lord, and we separate from the profane things, we separate and we dedicate ourselves wholly to God. You know, I mentioned at the beginning, separating from profane things would include pornography, adulterous relationships, holding on to bitterness, coveting, jealousy, judgment, criticism, accusation. It could be a million different things. Unforgiveness that we hold on to in our heart that, that if we want Christ to dwell there, we have to separate from those things. We have to get rid of those things out of our heart because Jesus is not going to compete with your rival. He's not going to compete with SELF, self. He's not competing with you. He isn't. Even the good things can keep you. Uh, even the good things, even ministry can keep you from him. So what happened to the church of Ephesus? So separating from those good and profane things and consecrating your heart fully to him. And the third thing is purify. This third meaning of this word is purify. The Lord is coming back for a pure bride. He's coming back for a bride without spot, stain, or blemish. He's coming back for a glorious church. We are living in the day and the hour when the Lord, in fact, is purifying his bride. And the fire is burning in his church. He's coming as a refiner's fire and as a fuller soap. He's coming to baptize the church in fire. And a lot of times in the charismatic church, we say, yes, praise God. That means I'm going to be passionate and worship God with passion. Yeah, that's true, but after the fire is burned away, everything you love, that's not of him, <laughs> which can mean pain. I'm not saying always. I think it's both. It's both an empowering fire of passion and a fire of jealousy that burns away everything that hinders God's love from flowing in your heart, unhindered. God wants to purify our hearts. God wants to purify the bride. Man, does the church need this purifying work? Does the Lord need to purify the church? The, the church that needs that, that fire, that refiner's fire, to purify our hearts from defilement of flesh, defilement of spirit. God, baptize us in your fire. Noel used to say, I loved what he said. He said, what we, noble man from Australia used to say, what we give, he takes. What he takes, he cleans. What he cleans, he fills. And what he fills, he controls. Say that one more time. Is what we give, he takes. What he takes, he cleans. What he cleans, he fills. So the Lord is filling a vessel that's clean. He's not filling a vessel that's unclean. He's not filling a vessel that's mixed. What he fills, he controls. And I just said, you know, I like to say it like this, just another way to say it. Whatever Jesus possesses, he purifies. God, here's my heart, he purifies. Whatever Jesus purifies, he fills. Whatever Jesus fills, he directs towards his perfect plan, purpose, and will. I want this. Only the pure in heart will see God. Man, let that, let's not Americanize that verse. He means what he says. Purity is vital in the work of sanctification. When you're justified, you're declared righteous by the imputation of Christ's righteousness to your account, by on the condition of faith and repentance. But sanctification is that lifelong work. It's that lifelong process that God works to purify the heart. I mean, 
only the pure in heart will see him. I mean, Jesus was telling the truth. God, we need that purity of heart. We need that purity of heart. We need the cleansing work of the Holy Spirit to purify our hearts of anything of self, anything of sin, anything that would defile, that we might be clean and pure and holy. Okay, the next point, number, the next way to release the life of Christ from our spirit is actually that point, releasing the life and godliness in you. I mean, just imagine, this, this is the way a lot of Christians think. Just imagine Hoover Dam in Nevada, one of the largest dams in the United States. We've got that, this reservoir, which is Lake Mead. Now, just imagine there, there, go, there comes a time when the, the community is experiencing a drought, but there's a massive reservoir behind this dam. But, but for some reason, some, a church in there sends intercessors, and they begin praying, God, send rain, send rain, send rain. And they're like, no, you don't need to send rain. You need to re- open the dam because the water's already there. All the water that's needed to take care of the community is there. But it's kind of like the way a lot of Christians are. Lord, pour out your love on me. Pour out your peace on me. Pour out your joy on me. I'm not saying that's wrong. I mean, if you're praying, I'm just thankful you're praying. But Think about it this way. I I made a change. I used to pray that way. Think about it this way. Instead of saying, Lord, pour it on me, say, Lord, release it from within me. You don't need, just like in that scenario, they didn't need God to send rain. They needed to simply open the dam and let what was already there flow. A lot of people are are, are just waiting for this massive end-time revival to come. I do believe that's coming. I do believe there will be an end-time outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But they live all their life just looking for that moment when it's going to come. We have no idea when God's going to finally pour out His Spirit in this one final move of the Spirit. We don't know. But I'll say this. We don't have to wait till then. We already have a significant outpouring of the Spirit within us. We need to just learn how to open the dam and release what is already within us. Instead of going, Lord, give me more love, give me more joy, give me more peace. Lord, release through me the life and godliness that's already in me. Lord, put the cross to my soul, purify my heart so there's nothing mixed that would hinder the full release of the Holy Spirit. See, you have a full salvation in your spirit. You have a full salvation in your spirit and you need to release that full salvation outward into your heart, your soul, and your body. That's why Paul said, work out your salvation. Work out, work out what God has already worked in. Release what you already have. You have everything for life and godliness Release what you already have. See, remember Paul said, put on a heart of compassion. Put on a heart of love. Put on a heart of kindness. You cannot put on clothes that you don't have. I cannot put on this shirt. This is like, duh. But I cannot put on this shirt if I didn't have this shirt already in my closet. I couldn't put on these pants or these shoes if they weren't already in my closet. You can't put on what you don't already have. That's why when Paul says, put on a heart of love, put on a heart of compassion, put on a heart of kindness, put on the new self, you can't put that on if you don't already have it in your closet. You have what you need for life and godliness. Put on what you already have. That brings me to the next point, is that we've got to put on Christ daily. A lot of Christians are just waking up. They're not spending any time before the Lord to put on their clothing, their spiritual clothing, and they're going out of their house in the pajamas of their self-life. I mean, you wake up in your pajamas, and, you know, like when it's wintertime, I have my long pajamas, my long sleeve T-shirt. I mean, I would never, maybe if I was going to try to embarrass Anna, I might, you know, do something with her friends and that, but for the most, just kidding, for the most part, 
always, I'm not going to go outside. I might take the trash out of my pajamas. But for the most part, if I'm going to go to the grocery store, I don't know what, by the way, this trend is for people wearing pajamas to Walmart or a grocery I don't get that. Anyway, I, I'm like walking around like, what? Why do you have pajamas on? That's weird. That's weird. Maybe it's just the Walmart where we are in Paulding County. I don't know. Could be. I don't know. It just probably is. But anyway, I don't get that, but that's not the point of the message. But they... They might need to hear this message that they're just like they're putting wearing pajamas to the grocery store, which I don't, if, if any of you wear pajamas to the grocery store, please forgive me. I don't mean to insult you. I don't know if you do or don't. No one's told me, hey, you need to secretly confront. People, this person's wearing pajamas to the grocery store. Okay, if you want to wear pajamas to the grocery store, that's fine. Okay? I'm not judging you. Maybe, I don't know. I just don't get it. But anyways, point... I personally would not wear pajamas to Walmart or to the grocery store. And I kind of think like, what'd you say? What'd you say? What'd you say? I said thank you. You are welcome. And my daughter and my wife, thank you. So I would not wear pajamas to Walmart or the grocery store or Costco or any of that. But that's the way a lot of Christians are with their own self-life is they're wearing their pajamas to work of self-life. They're not taking the time to wait on the Lord. They're not taking the time before they go out to clothe their hearts in the life of Jesus Christ. They're not waiting on him to say, Lord, fill my heart. Come into my heart. Uh, just make your home in my heart. Make, your, make my heart your habitation. And then saying, Lord, fill and clothe me with your life and with your attributes. You've got to put on Christ daily. That means you've got to have a routine. You've got to have a schedule. You've got to be disciplined. You know, so we don't like discipline in the charismatic church, but discipline is important that we, that we do have a, a routine. We do have a schedule where we meet with the Lord. We do, just like we have a natural routine where we, to, you know, get ready and do all the things we do to get ready, we also have a spiritual routine where we get ready and clothe our hearts with Jesus so that when we go out to wherever God you know, has us, whether it's working or family or whatever, we are not naked, so to speak, by the self-life. We have on Christ. We're clothed with Christ. So if we want to put on Christ, we've got to make that a routine. Okay, so I guess some other people have noticed pajamas at Walmart besides me. I thought I was the only one, me and Angie. Like, what? Okay, last point here. You know, we, we, this whole teaching started with John chapter 15, when, John, when the Lord spoke about abide in me and I, and abide in me and I in you, for apart from me, you can do nothing. And, you know, basically the abiding life, we walked through the abiding life for about 30 sessions and all this involved in the abiding life. Maybe one of the most important is what we've talked about in this session, that Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of God, must dwell in our heart. And as Christ dwells in our heart, as his home, as his habitation, then we're, we're fully abiding in him. We're fully removing the hindrances so his life can be released out of our heart. Um, and so the word abide, you know, we don't really use the word abide in our culture at all. You don't say, hey, abide here while I go to the Walmart in my pajamas. You don't say that. But... The word abide means to stay, to stay in a place, to stay in a relationship, to stay in an expectancy. And so um, this word abide has a similar meaning as dwell, and it really is, is connecting what Paul said all the way back in Ephesians chapter 3. I think there's a, a real connection here between John chapter 15 and Ephesians chapter 3 is that when we, if we want to live the abiding life, if we want to produce that fruit organically, that's not by us striving in the flesh to do something for God, living for God. If we want to live from God, then we got to have Christ making his home in our heart, Christ abiding in our heart, Christ living rather than us. And so that's what, you know, if we want to abide in Christ, if we want to live that abiding life, we've got to allow Christ to make his home in our heart. We've got to say, Lord, make your home in my heart. And so we'll end this uh, session. We'll end this class. This is, we'll, you know, hopefully this has helped you. Um, but I, I just think if you want to just, just turn this 
Turn what you learn. It's got to get into your prayer life. It's got to get into your conversation with the Lord. If it doesn't, all it is is a teaching that has no relevance to your life. It will not produce fruit. But if you get it into your conversation, if you get it into your prayer time with the Lord, you will begin to live the abiding life. Christ will begin to fill your heart, occupy your heart, make his home in your heart. And when the Lord makes his home in your heart, you will abide in him and produce the fruit of the spirit, the fruit, the, the uh, fruit, much fruit and fruit that remains. So God bless you. Amen and amen. Let me pray and we'll, we'll end here. Father, we thank you for this, Lord. We thank you for this time. Father, we pray that you would just really get this deep into our hearts, Lord. Do a work in us, Lord. Do a work in our hearts, we pray. I ask you to come, Jesus, by the Spirit. Just agree with me if you want it. Come, Lord, into our hearts. Make your home in our heart. Make your home in our heart, Lord. Occupy and fill and dwell in our hearts by faith, we pray. And Lord, live your life in us and live your life through us, Lord. I pray we sanctify you as Lord. We say, we hallow your name and say, Lord, all we are is yours. We surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Lord, we separate from profane things and consecrate our heart to you, Lord. And we just say, God, would you come and would you purify our hearts, Lord? We're asking you, Lord, to do that work in us, Lord. That self-life would be dethroned in Christ as life would be enthroned in our hearts. That we would live by your life, your life source. I pray that in Jesus' mighty name, Lord, seal the work you have done in this class for so many sessions. And let us live every day, every moment, by your indwelling life. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we'll end the online portion here.